Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Feinstein, and we're celebrating the 100th birthday of Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin, considered to be the most important piece of American music created in the 20th century. I'm going to tell the story of the Rhapsody in Blue, as was told to me by many people who were present when Gershwin was writing it. There are actualities and sound clips of Gershwin's friends speaking, and a great special sort of world premiere surprise connected with George Gershwin and Rhapsody in Blue at the end of this program. For six years, I worked for Ira Gershwin, who was the brother of George Gershwin. I guess I should tell you who George Gershwin is, in case you don't know. George Gershwin is considered to be the greatest American composer in history. He was born September 26, 1898, and he died July 11, 1937, at the age of 38 from the effects of a brain tumor. And George Gershwin was a man who was essentially self-taught. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, and self-educated in music, and was this phenomenon who eventually started writing popular songs that became among the most popular music in American society in the 20s and 30s, and at the same time, in the 1920s, started writing concert pieces. So it's like imagining somebody like Justin Bieber or Kanye West having hit songs and then all of a sudden writing pieces that are played by symphony orchestras. It's that kind of mind warp that was so astonishing to people that George Gershwin, who was writing these these pop hits, suddenly was writing concert works. Well, the first major concert work that George Gershwin wrote was a piece called Rhapsody in Blue. And Rhapsody in Blue is a piece that was written to order, written on demand. To put it in perspective, in the 1920s, the main dissemination of American popular music was by piano rolls, which were rolls of paper that would be loaded into a piano, and there would be a mechanical reproducing mechanism that would play these rolls, and many people had player pianos in their homes in order to listen to music. The other way that people uh, consumed music was by sheet music, which was printed and had the, the notes, the musical notes and the words of a song in it. And almost everybody had a piano in their home or their parlor, and they would play uh, songs on the piano. And uh, songs would become hits by the sales of sheet music. Radio was very much in its infancy in 1924, and yet people were also starting to listen to radio and radio became one of the predominant means of disseminating music and popular culture. So in this period that George Gershwin was creating music, it was very much a transitional time for technology, for culture, uh, Americans finding their own voice with music and in other aspects of society. And here comes this brash young man who is an extraordinary piano player. George Gershwin was a man who was very much a part of of uh, New York. His parents were Russian immigrants, and he was a first-generation American. And it was very important to uh, him and his family that they be Americans. His parents were very proud of being American, and Gershwin was a kid who was not a good student. He was a guy who grew up on the streets of New York because New York was a playground to explore and discover. He would go to Coney Island to the carnivals and listen to the different kinds of circus music that was happening there, or go up to Harlem and listen to the jazz and blues that were developing. And, and then he went to Yiddish theater on the Lower East Side. And it was all of these different sounds, plus all the different cultures that were thrown together because New York has always been called the melting pot of culture and society because Irish, Italians, Asians, uh, Polish, everybody from all over the world came to New York and they all mixed together in what was called the melting pot and created a new type of society that everybody banded together in the free world to create a home that was leaving behind all of the problems and issues that caused people to leave their own homeland. So that's where George Gershwin came from. And he was somebody who liked music but never paid much attention to it until a friend of his in school played a violin solo that captivated him, and he suddenly discovered when he sat down at a piano by happenstance that he had this ability to, to make music. So in 1919, George Gershwin had his first big song hit, a thing called Swanee, that was sung by Al Jolson, and it was 
uh, a song that sold millions of records and pieces of sheet music, and it started to put George Gershwin on the map. Well, Gershwin, by 1922, had written a number of song hits, and he met a man named Paul Whiteman. Paul Whiteman was a band leader who had one of the most popular bands in the United States, so much so that they started creating what they called ghost bands, where people would go out with the Paul Whiteman band without Whiteman himself because everybody wanted to hire Paul Whiteman. And in the days before modern technology, you would have to go uh, to, to uh, a concert or a, a dance hall to hear uh, somebody play live. That was to, the preferred way to listen to music because recordings were very primitive sounding. So there were these Paul Whiteman units all over the country because people could not get enough of Paul Whiteman. And Whiteman was a man who was uh, a great self-promoter, and he was always on the pulse of society. He always was picking up what uh, things were going on in culture that he could appropriate and turn into financial and commercial success. And he got an idea in late 1923 to present a concert in a concert hall as opposed to being in a, a dance hall or a, a restaurant or a nightclub to formally perform some of the music that he had been playing casually in these other night spots. His thinking was that Jazz was becoming very much an important part of American culture, and he felt that jazz was just as important as classical music, and therefore felt that he should feature jazz in a concert hall setting, and wanted to mix jazz with classical music of that time, and create a sort of new hybrid sound. Well, one of the things that spurred him to do that was that one of his competitors, a man named Vincent Lopez, had also gotten the same idea and was out to book a hall to do a similar concert. Here's a recording of Paul Whiteman talking about the genesis of that concert. So my manager came to me one day and he said, you know, you've been talking about this concert for two years and I got news for you. Your biggest competitor has already hired uh, the Metropolitan Opera House and is going to give the first jazz concert. And I said, well, over my dead body, this isn't going to happen. So uh, I went out right away and tried to find a hall, and uh, I don't know, all the halls were rented. I couldn't get in Carnegie Hall or most any other place. However, I could get in Aeolian Hall on the 12th of February, that was 1924. Unfortunately, this was only about three weeks from the time that I'm now talking. But anyway, I hired the hall, and then I called up the different uh, newspapers and told them that I was going to give the jazz concert, and uh, everything seemed to be fairly well settled. Paul Whiteman was a great self-promoter and uh, was given to exaggeration. So as he told the story about the creation of Rhapsody in Blue, it would morph from, from time to time. And yet there is always a kernel of truth in, in what he says, and he was uh, very dynamic and interesting when he spoke. He gave an interview to the New York World newspaper in which he announced that George Gershwin was going to write a concert piece for his upcoming concert, as well as Irving Berlin, and he might have even mentioned Puccini. Well, Gershwin had met Paul Whiteman in 1922 when they worked on a musical review called The George White Scandals, and it was for that review that Gershwin wrote a little operetta piece that was cut after the first night of The Scandals, because The Scandals was essentially a girly show, and Gershwin's piece was considered too ambitious and out of place in The Scandals. And so, Whiteman saw that Gershwin had this ability to write larger-scale works, and evidently he had suggested to George two years before the Rhapsody in Blue was created that uh, perhaps George could write a concert work for him at some point, and George said, sure, that, that would be interesting, and then he forgot about it. Well, he forgot about it until Whiteman gave this interview, and it was printed in the New York World. Here's Ira Gershwin, George's older brother, talking about that. One day in January 1924, I called George's attention to an item in the music column of a morning paper to the effect that Whiteman was going through with his idea of doing a concert. It was to be at Aeolian Hall, and Whiteman was going to feature a suite by Victor Herbert and also something by George Gershwin. So we have the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. We have George Gershwin, who's commissioned to write a piece. Well, Gershwin says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll write this piece. There's not much time, but... I'll, I'll give it a shot, essentially. He said he would do it. And Gershwin had a great deal of confidence because he 
was very facile in his ability to create music. It came very quickly to him, not that he didn't work very hard on refining it and making it as good as it could be. And so he decided to write a piece of music that would be for piano and orchestra. And when I say orchestra, it was actually created for the Paul Whiteman Dance Band. It was not created as a classical piece. It was not created for a symphony orchestra. It was created for Whiteman's band. And so he tailored this piece to Whiteman's own instrumental needs. Gershwin was a guy who always had ambitions to write larger scale works along with American popular song. And so he had ideas to write operas, to write uh, piano concertos, symphonies, string quartets, all of these things were things that he wanted to explore in the classical music form, melding those forms with jazz and American popular music. With Rhapsody in Blue, it was the first step towards uh, bringing those two worlds together. So Gershwin very hurriedly set out to work on the Rhapsody in Blue. Now, I must say that there is some controversy as to the timeline as to when Rhapsody in Blue was first begun by George Gershwin because the article that was in the New York World came out in early 1924, but there is also evidence that Gershwin was already working on this piece for piano and orchestra in 1923. In any event, there was very little time left for him to prepare the work, and Gershwin had been orchestrating for... Uh, orchestras, and so he knew how to orchestrate for a, a, an instrumental group as opposed to just writing a song that could be played on the piano. And yet, because of the paucity of time, Ferdy Grofay, who was Paul Whiteman's orchestrator, worked every day with George Gershwin on orchestrating what was to become Rhapsody in Blue. So here's Ferdy Grofay talking about his memories of working with George. At the time uh, we were writing it, uh, Gershwin lived in a, an apartment house in New York, and uh, I uh, called on him every day to pick up whatever music he had written, and then I'd take it home and score it. And uh, that was a close association over, oh, I guess about 10 days, two weeks' time. Oh, and when it comes to the E major, uh, the da 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 you know, Part of it, uh, when he had gotten to that point, he had written something else that had nothing to do with the piece at all. Well, I didn't say much, but he saw that I wasn't exactly pleased, so he started, he always liked to improvise on the piano, so he had to play this melody, and I asked him, I said, what is that? What he said, I, I wrote it about five years ago when I was demonstrating uh, uh, piano sheet music to the, to the theatrical trade, you know. He, um... I was paid about $25 a week to do this. So he says, I happened to write it then. And he says, uh, well, it's just another. <laughs> I said, it sounds pretty good to me. Would you mind playing it again? And I'll, I'd like to make a lead sheet. I would take it home. So he did. And I, I wrote it down and took it home. And I couldn't sleep that night. And I, and I started playing it on the piano myself. I, I did, it just wouldn't let me rest. So I went back the next day and I... I said, well, why don't you write something like this and, uh, instead of what you have there now? And, uh, oh, he says, ah, I said, it's too trite. It's too sentimental. <laughs> I said, it's the most haunting thing I ever heard. I said, I wish you'd uh, consider it. And by that time, uh, Ira, uh, Izzy, we call him Izzy then, he was probably, you know, the lyric writer, I happened to come in the room and, and he was wondering what we were talking about and we told him and... And he said, uh, to George, well, I don't remember that tune. Play it. Uh, George played it for him. Oh, yes. And uh, I said, well, I, I think Freddie's got a point there. Well, I said, well, why don't you use it? Uh, the the uh, classicists, they, they keep firing it from their own tunes. They keep <laughs> using it over and over. I said, uh, because you wrote it five years ago, it wouldn't make any difference. You should use it. So every day, the Rhapsody in Blue was starting to come together. It was quite extraordinary because... Gershwin would go to rehearsals at the Palais Royal, and he would listen to the band play little sections of the piece. And word got out that something interesting was happening with this piece that George Gershwin was writing. And other people started to go to these rehearsals at the Palais Royal in preparation for this February 12th concert to be given at Aeolian Hall. And it was a buzz that was starting about what Gershwin was creating. Even though George wasn't quite sure what was happening and he wasn't particularly well-schooled in classical form and the Rhapsody 
uh, is a piece that is pretty much free form, but his inspiration was supreme. One night during the creation of what became Rhapsody in Blue, George and Ira and their friends went down to Greenwich Village to the home of their friends Emily and Lou Paley. George had written some songs with Lou Paley several years earlier, and the Paley's used to host parties, which they called salons in those days, which were gatherings of artists, writers, musicians, playwrights, and they would all share their works, and uh, it was sort of a beautiful free-for-all that was just bubbling with artistic ideas and fun and creativity. And they were all young kids who were so excited about creating... Uh, new innovations in, in, in culture and in all the arts. So George inevitably would sit down at the piano because he was an incredible piano player and he could play anything, and he was playing what he had thus written of his concert piece. And it was Ira who came up with the title for Rhapsody in Blue. Someone said, George, play what you've done so far on the, your piece for Whiteman. So George played what he had written up to that point, and... Uh, which is about halfway through, and then somebody on the couch said, uh, what are you going to call it? And George said, uh, oh, American Fantasy, American Rhapsody. Now, that afternoon, I had made my uh, one of many trips to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and that day I'd been particularly impressed by uh, uh, Whistler. And all his paintings were studying scarlet and gold, were studying blue and yeah. green and so forth. So uh, just like that, I said, Rhapsody in Blue. And George turned around, he said, that sounds pretty good. He said, I think I'll use it. The concert was sold out. February 12th, it was in the afternoon. It was uh, Lincoln's birthday. And it was a day that it was raining and it was uh, hot in the hall. And Whiteman commenced with this concert, which was called An Experiment in Modern Music. Ira Gershwin recalled to me that he was much more nervous than his brother George was. And Ira was sitting with his friend Cecilia Ager, who was the wife of a songwriter named Milton Ager, who later wrote a song called Happy Days Are Here Again. And Ira recalled that Cecilia was also so nervous for George that her fingernails were digging into Ira's wrist as they were sitting there. And Ira had an original program from the Aeolian Hall concert and it was defaced because he was so nervous that he had scribbled all over it in pen and had done little doodles and drawings, something that he <laughs> regretted later because of a, a premiere program from the first performance of Rhapsody in Blue is now worth an extraordinary amount of money. In any event, the, uh, the concert began, and it was kind of slow going. It started out well, but it was a long, long program in two parts, and it was something that was wearing thin because the idea of mixing jazz and classical music was in its rudimentary presentation at Aeolian Hall and that Whiteman would take a piece like Song of India written by Rimsky-Korsakov and just put a dance beat. And so people started to get restless in the audience. Now, at the same time, Whiteman had been promoting this concert endlessly, and all the announcements were highlighting the fact that the great American composer Victor Herbert was writing a new concert piece for the Whiteman Orchestra, and that was supposed to be the highlight of the concert, even though it was also announced that George Gershwin would be writing a piece. There was also a very popular novelty pianist named Zez Confrey, he used to write these little piano pieces that uh, involve sort of tricks on the piano, very technically difficult. His most famous piece was a thing called Kitten on the Keys, and Zez Confrey put posters all over New York announcing he was going to perform at the, the Whiteman concert and was going to be playing these novelties. Well, by the middle of the second half of the concert, the audience was just downright bored, and it was just a little too much. Perhaps Whiteman had been too ambitious. The Victor Herbert piece was premiered called A Suite of Serenades, and it got a polite and respectable applause, but it did not set the world on fire. And then towards the end of the concert, the second of the last piece was the premiere of what was now called Rhapsody in Blue. 
this very young, dapper, dark-haired man named George Gershwin confidently strode out onto the stage, and he took his place at the piano, and then magic happened. I've had the opportunity to speak to many people who were present at the first performance of Rhapsody in Blue, and one of them was Johnny Green, who was a great songwriter whose biggest song is called Body and Soul. Johnny used to love telling a story of that first performance of Rhapsody in Blue, and happily it was memorialized on tape. Uh, it was the afternoon of Friday, February 12, Lincoln's birthday, 1924. I was, at the time of which I speak, uh, just uh, 14 and a half. I barreled downtown from Riverdale, uh, where Horace Mann's school was, to Aeolian Hall. There's some people who still think that the world premiere of Rhapsody in Blue took place in the evening at Carnegie Hall. It did not took place at Aeolian Hall, which no longer exists. Whiteman had, I guess, what was then the most respected and popular dance band uh, in the world. In that original band were such luminaries as Mike Pingator, who played the guitar, the banjo. That was pre-guitar days. And Ross Gorman, who was the uh, first saxophonist who also doubled on clarinet and, of course, was the first man ever to play that uh, F to G long trill and then the B-flat major scale up to that high B-flat with which the Rhapsody in Blue opens. And um, as has so often been recounted, the audience at uh, Aeolian Hall that afternoon was a who's who of the world of the arts, music, theater, you name it, uh, Stravinsky was in the audience. Uh, uh, Stokowski was in the audience. Have you, anybody you can think of, Deems Taylor was in the audience. And the place was packed. And um, I think I recall the numbers correctly. It was an endless program, Clyde. Much too long. Uh, there were 24 numbers on the program, and George Gershwin... And the Rhapsody in Blue were, as I recall, the 22nd of 24 numbers. Uh, the program included, further as I recall, de oh, definitely included a suite also commissioned by Whiteman from Victor Herbert, which was uh, pleasant enough, you know, but not in, a, not in the class of importance and excellence as the Herbert operettas. And I think that that first concert also included a work by the American composer Leo Sowerby, in any case, this was long pre the days of air conditioning, you know. And it was a bitter cold day. As I recall, there was snow that afternoon. And the uh, interior of Aeolian Hall was unbearably hot. And believe it or not, before Gershwin came on, many people had left for two reasons. They were dying of the heat and the close atmosphere and... More importantly, they were by that time bored. Well, George Gershwin ran to the piano, as he always did, very much like Arthur Rubenstein. He couldn't wait to get to the piano. And he nodded to Whiteman, and Ross Gorman played that opening scale on the clarinet. And, well, one knew within the first what, 15 seconds that one was being exposed to a musical shot to be heard around the world. Now, Clyde, you know me pretty well by now, and you know that I'm a sentimental slob. Well, at least I now have it under some control. When the big E major lyrical theme came that afternoon, mind you, I was 14 and a half. I died. I mean, I sobbed, I choked, my heart rate went up, and, uh, you know, it was a riot when the piece finished. And Gershwin was launched as a major composer. So many of us have known all along what the world is now shouting as if it was just a discovery, you know, that George Gershwin is one of the true monuments among composers. The flashing neon light around the world as the American composer, is now generally conceded to be George Gershwin. 
Anyway, I don't know what else to tell you about that afternoon of February 12th, except that it was a landmark in my life. I met Gershwin shortly thereafter, and as you know, he and I became close, close friends, which we remained until the day of his tragically untimely death. Because Rhapsody in Blue was assembled so quickly, Gershwin, in the original manuscript, had a solo piano section that he was to play at the concert, and because he was so focused on the passages that involved orchestra that needed to be orchestrated, left a note on the score that said, wait for nod. In other words, the solo piano section was something that Gershwin was either going to improvise or had conceived in his head but had not written down. So Paul Whiteman just waited until George looked at him and nodded, meaning that he could go on with the next section of the piece. Well, the next section of the piece after Gershwin's extended piano solo was the famous Andante. At the conclusion of the Rhapsody in Blue, it was clear that the audience had experienced something that was very, very special. They might not have known that American music would never be the same after that, but they knew that they were witnessing a certain kind of history. And the attendees at that concert included the intelligentsia of New York, all the great musicians of the time, and they all knew, whether they liked the piece or not, that music was fundamentally different from that point on. After the concert, Gershwin went to a dinner at the Lambs Club, which was a theatrical club, and this dinner was hosted by Victor Herbert, who uh, held court afterwards and uh, very uh, politely told George how he would have written Rhapsody in Blue had he composed it. Well, it's odd because it's sort of like a passing of the torch because Victor Herbert was the most famous American composer at that moment and he died later in 1924. So it was almost as if he was passing the torch to Gershwin who fundamentally changed American music and advanced music from sort of the old-fashioned European traditions of operetta and classical form and incorporated the new jazz sounds. Well, after Rhapsody in Blue, surprisingly for George and for his older brother Ira, there were requests to repeat Rhapsody in Blue. And Whiteman asked Gershwin to play it again, and he played it a month later with Gershwin at the piano at Carnegie Hall, where it had its debut there. So right after that, George finds out that his publisher is interested in publishing Rhapsody in Blue, and he tells his older brother Ira, and Ira says, For God's sake, George, who's going to buy it? And their perspective was that it was a piece that was for piano and dance band, and so where was it going to be played, who was going to play it? But uh, there was already enough interest that the publisher wanted to print it, and so it was published. And then in June of 1924, after which uh, Gershwin had repeated performances of Rhapsody of Blue many, many times, and suddenly it looked like this piece was going to have a life, uh, recorded the piece. And... He recorded it with the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, and that recording was so successful that by 1927, Gershwin made another recording of Rhapsody in Blue with new advanced electrical technology to uh, further the sales of Rhapsody in Blue. The irony is, again, they at that time didn't think much of Rhapsody as far as it's having a life. Uh, Ira Gershwin's then-girlfriend, Leonor Strunsky, when she heard Rhapsody in Blue, said, well, what good is it? You can't dance to it. Because she was a flapper. I mean, it's like if you couldn't dance to it, why would anybody want to hear this piece? So it was kind of this weird work that was not a dance piece. It was, it was not popular. It was not classical. It was sort of in between. But evidently, that's what people were clamoring for, a new sound in music. George Gershwin very quickly became defined by the success of Rhapsody in Blue, even though he had had many song hits and in 1924 had a very productive year, the same year as Rhapsody in Blue. He went to England and wrote his first major musical comedy for the Brits, and he also, in December of 1924, wrote a musical called Lady Be Good, which was a huge success on Broadway and ushered in the new song hits that Gershwin had written, including things like Fascinating Rhythm and Lady Be Good, and he wrote a song for it, for it called The Man I Love that also became a, a classic. Uh, but 1924 was a watershed year for George Gershwin because in that same period, the New York Symphony 
commissioned him to write another concert piece. And so he wrote a piano concerto called Concerto in F that was premiered uh, late in 1925, and suddenly George Gershwin, this Tin Pan Alley guy who was just writing and playing popular songs, was regarded as the great hope of American music. He was the first composer featured on the cover of Time magazine. The enormity of his success is hard to explain in today's terms because media was very, very different and we didn't have instantaneous transmission of music and culture. And yet George Gershwin's name became famous all over the world. He became the most famous American composer. And by 1928, when he made a trip to Europe and went to Paris and London and Berlin, he met the greatest musical minds of that time. He met Maurice Ravel and he met Alban Berg and he met uh, many other creative luminaries because they all wanted to meet George Gershwin. He met Stravinsky and it's a true story that he asked Ravel if uh, the great Maurice Ravel would give him uh, lessons in composition and Ravel said how much money do you earn a year and Gershwin told him this astronomical amount and, and Ravel said well then perhaps I should take lessons from you. So Rhapsody in Blue became George Gershwin's theme song, if you will. He had a number of radio shows through the years, and by 1934, Gershwin decided to go on a concert tour celebrating the 10th anniversary of Rhapsody in Blue. Well, Gershwin had played the Rhapsody in Blue hundreds of times by that point, and some of his close friends said that he had lost some of the magic in his ability to interpret it. So George Gershwin recorded Rhapsody in Blue uh, several times. He recorded it twice for the Victor Company in 1924, 1927, but those were abbreviated versions because they could only fit a limited uh, amount of music uh, on the sides of a record. So they cut out about a third of the Rhapsody in Blue. He played it a lot on radio, but those were ephemeral. They were live performances, and most of them did not survive. There's one very odd performance with uh, the Fred Waring group from 1934 where there is a choir uh, joining him and the, the thing is called a travesty on Rhapsody in Blue, which meant that it was sort of a takeoff, which evidently Gershwin approved of because he's there playing it and he plays uh, Rhapsody in Blue beautifully, but it's encumbered by all of this other crazy vocal stuff. Rhapsody in Blue became so important in Gershwin's life that he intended to orchestrate it himself. I mentioned the piece was orchestrated by his friend Ferdy Grofay. George always wanted to go back to Rhapsody in Blue and reorchestrate it so it would have his own orchestration. But he was always distracted with working on other shows, uh, Broadway scores, film scores, writing other concert works. He wrote a second Rhapsody. He wrote the Cuban Overture. He wrote the I Got Rhythm Variations, which was a work that he composed for the 10th anniversary tour of Rhapsody in Blue. But sadly, he died in July of 1937 at the age of 38. And even though he left us extraordinary musical works, he never had the opportunity to write so much of what he intended to give to all of us. Perhaps his greatest work other than Rhapsody in Blue is Porgy and Bess, the great American opera. But we'll never know what George Gershwin might have accomplished had he lived to a ripe old age. Many, many years later, I had the opportunity to work for George's brother, Ira, and I spent six years taking care of Ira Gershwin's archive, and it was quite staggering to me to be nestled among all of these artifacts that had been touched by George Gershwin because I could feel his energy in all of these items and to look at manuscripts of things he had composed, unpublished songs and other fragments of melodies that never saw the light of day. And even though we've heard most of what Gershwin wrote because some of his unpublished things have been released posthumously, it is Rhapsody in Blue that will always remain the most seminal and important work in the Gershwin canon and also in American music. Recently, very recently, Another performance of Gershwin performing Rhapsody in Blue from 1934 surfaced. It's with the Ted Weems Orchestra, and it has not been heard since it was broadcast early in February of 34. And it's amazing because he plays with such vitality and plays passages that he did not otherwise record. And so, for the first time since 1934, you get a chance to hear Gershwin 
playing Rhapsody in Blue.
recording exists thanks to the archaeology and detective work of David Plotkin, who very generously loaned that recording from his private collection for all of us to hear. Thank you, David. I'm Michael Feinstein. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. <laughs>